in to Engage MH, the Power of Mixing podcast, Moet Hennessy's first portfolio show. I'm Angela Sauve, Director of Trade Engagement, and I'm thrilled to welcome back my co-hosts, Rich Buchanan, Laura Catlaw, Senior Managers of Trade Engagement. Hello, everyone. Bonjour, y'all. Welcome back, Rich Buchanan. Oh, it's nice to be back. <laughs> So we have a pretty exciting show today. This is a topic that is close to our hearts because today's episode is all about mixology. Are you excited? Yes, I am excited. <laughs> I'm very much eager to hear about the two guests that we have on oh. the show. So why don't you tell us who's coming? Yes, today we invite Lynette Marrero, award-winning mixologist, founder of Speed Rack, the first female bartending competition, and more to join us. And we are also inviting, very excited, uh, Moet Hennessy's first portfolio mixologist, Charles Hardwick, who will teach us how to craft a New York sour. I may be a bit biased. Charles and I started together on the first day, and I think he has the perfect voice for a podcast. So I'm eager to have him on the show. He does have a voice for radio. Professional yeah. podcast voice. 100%. Yep. So get ready. Put those headphones in. <laughs> <laughs> but before we get to uh, chatting about chatting with Lynette, you know, meeting Charles, let's talk about mixology. Are you going to tell us a story? Tell, oh, tell us a story, please. Absolutely. A mixology story, right? Take us there. <laughs> All right. So when I was thinking about the theme of the show, mixology, I started to wonder where the term mixologist actually came from and I went down a rabbit hole. <laughs> so where did the term mixologist come from? Let me tell you. And to quote our friends at Vine Pear, it has a surprisingly long history. So bartending is an ancient practice that can trace its roots back to the Greek and the Roman times. And during the ancient times, patrons relied, as they do today, on their local expert to pour their favorite drinks. Now, by the 15th century, bartenders throughout Europe were primarily known as innkeepers, and they typically produced their own spirits and ales. How cool is that? That's fascinating. Pretty cool. Flash forward to the 19th century in the 1800s, where bartenders were experimenting with cocktails, and they contained some pretty incredible examples of inspiration. And in New York, bartenders were trying out all kinds of wild ideas, creating exciting concoctions that delighted the locals. Now, the first cocktail process book was actually a book by Jerry the Professor Thomas in 1862, and it's called The Bartender's Guide. You might have heard of it. And this is the first time in print that the secrets to creating classic cocktails like the old fashioned would be revealed. Is this an original? Do if, you have if, an original? If Angela had an original, she would not have left the house with it. <laughs> that is a lovely reprint. And it is such a great I'm book. I'm just saying it looks like it. I think it's an original. <laughs> it's originally super cool. Um, the, <laughs> the cocktails in here are so amazing. They're, they're kind of quirky. The measurement systems are, are very strange. It does contain one of my favorite cocktails which is the Japanese cocktail, which is a wonderful uh, cognac cocktail. I use Hennessy VSOP, and then Orgeat and bitters. Oof, I think it's page 23 in that book, so there you go. Is it really page 23? Yeah. Yeah. I did, I did I'll a check little later, research. I'll check later. A little research. So, I mean, though people do think that this, this book, Jerry Thomas's Bartender's Guide, was the first time that the term mixologist was coined, but, it actually made its day a little a debut a little bit earlier um, in 1856 in the Knickerbocker magazine, which was published in upstate New York. And then the next time we see it before the bartender's guide is actually in 1860 in the Raftsman Journal from Clearfield, Pennsylvania. Laura, shout out Pennsylvania! Yeah. <laughs> So this is this is actually fascinating. So the paper featured an essay about a man in a hotel who mistakenly wandered into the room of another hotel guest. Is this a true mistake? Like he mistakenly wandered Genuinely in? mistakenly <laughs> went into this the wrong room. to me all the time. <laughs> Late at night. And he 
he scared the occupant, as you can imagine. And the man explained that he had come from the bar downstairs and that the mixologist of tipulars downstairs had directed him to that room, thinking that was his room. I think that's just a, that's a funny story. It is. And then in 1870, we also see mixologists begin to appear more frequently, this time in west, westward by rail. And then in the 1880s, the term actually um, was an elevated term to describe a bartender at a high-end establishment. Now, after the rise of the cocktail in the early 20th century, Americans were faced with a little thing called prohibition. And as we all know, these laws from the federal government made it illegal to make or consume alcohol. But we know that the bartending culture, they were, it remained alive, mm -hmm. very much alive uh, during the roaring, roaring 20s throughout Prohibition. And working in underground speakeasies, bartenders continued to provide their patrons with delicious cocktails. And in fact, during this time, some of the most popular cocktails that we enjoy today, like the gin and tonic, were invented during the illegal era. <laughs> now, the modern reclamation of mixologists can be directly attributed to one incredible talent within our industry, the one, the only, Dale DeGroff, who in the 1980s happened upon the term while he was researching 19th century bartending for his bar program at Joe Baum's legendary Rainbow Room. He considered the word befitting to the grandeur and showmanship that he hoped the bar would embody. I think that actually, I mean, I've known about mixology through my own personal life, but hearing the origins of it and how Moet Hennessy becomes part of that culture, I think is very fascinating. Yeah. Should we do a quick little behind the bottle? Yes. yes. Is, that the, is this the time? It's the yes. time. It's, it's the time, time for behind the bottle. Behind the bottle. Um, you know, normally we I talk about one bottle, but today I'm going to talk about almost two dozen bottles. Um, you know, one of the fascinating aspects of Moet Hennessy is that you know we're not just one big company. We're a, a, a collection of maisons or, or houses, and each maison is very independent, and they focus on their own unique brand of tradition, craftsmanship. Uh, innovation. And for years, we've had ambassadors with these maisons, and they've been doing amazing work, especially in the, the cocktail mixology world. Uh, I was thinking about the um, Hennessy My Way Challenge. That's a global bartending you know, competition. In 2023, we added kind of a new resource, which is our team. Our little team right here. It's us. And some other <laughs> it's folks. me. But our, the trade engagement and advocacy team. And our team is focused on the trade and, and using the power of the portfolio. Now, Rich, we say the word trade a lot, and I'd love for us to talk about who are we talking about when we talk about the trade, because they really are um, someone we're directly working with and, and, and gear a lot of our materials towards. You know, to me, I feel like the trade, these are the people who are in the trenches. These are the bartenders, these are the sommeliers, the, the beverage directors, the buyers, even in retail, you know, the people who are selling the products in the stores. Uh, we really want to be you know, meaningful within this space, within the space of the trade, uh, having this mindset of helping this community to grow. And our team, Trade Engagement Advocacy, you know, we're focused on people, on growth of these people and, and education. So when I hear the phrase power of mixing or the power of our portfolio, um, I think a lot about who we are and how we are, how Moet Hennessy has become very, very relevant very recently to the whole mixology culture. So I don't know if you can distill it down for me a bit onto um, how we show up in such a special way within this world now. Exactly. I mean, like you said, we you know this is interesting because we are approaching this from a portfolio level, multiple brands, multiple maisons, kind of in the mix. And so I think first and foremost is this team, this trade engagement advocacy team. And we built this team. This is new for Moet Hennessy. Uh, and once again, we're focused on people, growth, and education. Um, we also will see the the impact of this new world uh, at Moet Hennessy at Tales of the Cocktail uh, this year. 
where we'll have our first portfolio level or multi-brand experience at Tales of the Cocktail. And then if in Paris, there's a new project launching this summer. It's a collaboration with the iconic Cravon Bar. And this is going to be the first time that Moet Hennessy has their own bar. So let's go buy some plane tickets. I think we need to go to Paris. I'm ready. Let's go. Let's go. My bags are packed. (laughs) I have a bag constantly ready to go. So we're good to go. (laughs) And now let's shake it up with, and we're very excited for this, Lynette Marrero. Lynette is a bartending guru, women's industry champion, educator, inclusivity advocate, mentor, philanthropist, and of course, a craft cocktail savant. You may also recognize Lynette as the Latine co-creator of the Speed Rack International Women Bartending Competition. Lynette is also the master class mixology teacher, as well as the mixologist behind a new line of ready-to-drink beverages. Lynette, welcome. It's quite an impressive background, bio, resume, pioneering spirit. Uh, We're so excited to have you on the show today. So thank you for joining us. And this episode is all about mixology. So our first question for you today is, what is your absolute favorite go-to cocktail and why? Oh, wow. So that's like asking someone to pick their favorite child. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You know, cocktails are so there's such a beautiful range um, of what they are. I mean, if it's pushed, come to shove. I'm always a big fan of a classic martini. Um, I prefer mine with really a lot of vermouth. So I like a 50-50 or a two-to-one style. Uh, And I always like a lemon twist and an olive. So we, we affectionately call that grandma style in the industry. I mean, we've said it. You have an impressive background, and we are we're excited to to dive in a little bit more and learn about your journey. So, could you tell us more about how you have done all of the amazing things that we introed at the top, as well as your innovations? There's quite a few of them. So, I started, you know, craft cocktailing in New York, and at the time I started, it wasn't. We weren't sure it was going to be a full career yet. (laughs) It was just kind of moments where a lot of people were still um, bartending as a means to afford to live in New York. And I think a lot of big cities uh, felt that. London, San Francisco at the time, probably people were still in the same way. So I I started a wine bar um, down on Clinton Street back in the early 2000s. And it was a global wine list, and it was really great because I just kind of talked my way into it. But what I found was guests were really cool, and you could build relationships with the people coming in. And there was a lot happening in the Lower East Side at that time. Um, you know, Wiley Dufresne was just about to open WB50 on the same block. So the people that were coming in were, were really um, the people building the, the culinary scene and, and this industry that I would start really jumping into. Um, working after working there a few years, I actually moved on to, to working in a, a martini lounge. So at the time, martini lounges were places where everything was called a martini, not the kind I was talking about, the classic martini. <laughs> it was everything from, you know, graham cracker martinis to whatever kind of chocolate martini you wanted. <laughs> uh, you know, so lots of, lots of flavor, a lot of, um, you know, using a lot of even just flavored spirits to create those cocktails. Um, But while working there, I started getting introduced to the bar side. Um, There was a bartender named Amber Tinsley, and she wanted to start teaching me kind of basic drinks uh, because she thought I could be behind the bar. And every Thursday we closed, she would teach me a few drinks while while she was closing down. Um, And then we would go after work for a drink at the this new cocktail bar that had just opened um just kind of you know a few blocks away from us um and that was the flat iron lounge and the flat iron lounge was run by 
at the time, Julie Reiner, uh, her partner, Susan Fedroff, um, and another woman named Michelle Connolly. And I was just so enamored with this world, uh, walking into a, a beautifully designed art deco space where the cocktails had all those beautiful fruit flavors, but Julie was using fresh ingredients, um, you know, fresh passion fruit, not a passion fruit liqueur. Um, and she was bringing all of those items to craft cocktails. And I just fell in love with the, the style of drinks. So every day, you would, if, if you worked there, you would learn three new cocktails uh, that, you were, that you were serving. So I stalked them for about a year for a job. <laughs> <laughs> Persistence. And, and finally got a position there. Um, and I just, I just fell in love. And like Phil Ward, we're working behind the bar. He had worked his way up from, you know, being a busser there. Um, Katie Stipe, who creates the Siesta, one of my favorite cocktails. Um, she was behind the bar at the time. And then um, later on, uh, Toby Maloney, who just won the James Beard Award for his book, Bartender's Manifesto. He worked there while he was um, also at Milk and Honey, but also about to open Pegu Club uh, with Audrey Saunders. Um, they brought in Dale DeGroff. It brought in uh, Gary Gaz Regan, Dave Wandrich. Like everyone was coming to the bar and telling us information. And so I had access to all of these people who were researching and writing and putting the new the new systems in place. Mm -hmm. Of once I had that opportunity, I kind of really never never looked back i started to kind of wind down my my career in in theater and and started to embrace the the beautiful theatrical world of, of mixology and cocktail oh that's a, i love that the beautiful theatrical world because it is and that's an incredibly storied history with the titans of the industry what an incredible roster of mentors if we could ask you to look through your cocktail predicting crystal ball what do you predict that this time next year the most popular cocktails will be? Oh, this time next year, the most popular cocktail. Um, I think next year, I think we'll see more. Um, I think we'll see more spirits coming from other places really having their moment. I'm, I'm always optimistic that things like Pisco will have their heyday um, and, and that, you know, we'll see more, um, agaves that are not just traditional tequila in the market uh, or even mezcal that you'll see beyond you'll see beyond those um to other other varietals um you know and other other spirits that are coming from other places i think people are getting back to crazy travel so they'll start connecting those spirits and their travels um so I, i'm excited to see what you have um from there like bar in brooklyn there were so many different new amari and 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 ingredients coming from all over that were really fun to add to your um your cocktail arsenal lynette we'll have to so I, I think it's there's a lot of developments so. we'll have <laughs> okay. to meet this date next year and we'll check your predictions to see how psychic you are <laughs> um, <laughs> could you tell us more about what speed rack is and how did you come up with the idea absolutely so speed rack is uh we say it's an all women um, bartending competition um, that is based on speed and accuracy. Accuracy, um, but it raises money for breast cancer charities. So, taking off the model of kind of what I was doing with Lupec of like doing events where we brought women together um, to raise money for uh, local charities, I had met IV Mix in in 2010 and. And we started, you know, I invited her to start being a part of the event. We started Speed Rack to kind of bring together the group, uh, you know, and be a force to say, here we are, um, here's what we're doing, and you should hire us. Um, and we started to do it as, you know, I have loved food TV shows. So I was like, well, what if it's, you know, four drink rounds, you know, based on classic cocktails, and we'll have four judges. And, and, they, and it'll be like your working service bar on a Friday night and Audrey Saunders, Julie Reiner, Dale DeGroff, and Dave Wandrich sit in the four seats right at your service bar. And you have to make them four of the best classic cocktails you can 
while also then getting back to like the 70s seats of the restaurant or bar. We did the first event in June 2011 and it was crazy. It was like roller derby. It was, it was insane. It's like the competitors were just really fast and, and fierce and it was just rock and roll and very punk and you could just see them um, just how much they put into it and it was very infectious um, so we went on a tour and now here we are 12 years later still on tour and we've grown it across the world um, but it's, it's just an interesting it's kind of hard to capture it it's just like what it is it's a festival around the floor so if anyone's coming to the cocktail we're doing our event on Sunday July 23rd you get to come in and sample all these delicious uh, drinks and cocktails from from all of the brand sponsors, but then you're watching this like head-to-head insane cocktail competition. Lynette, I just had a flashback to my years of bartending, being at the service bar, <laughs> focusing on the client in front of me, and then going, oh my God, the uh-huh. service printer, going to the service printer and pulling <laughs> a line <laughs> of tickets that was like 30 tickets long. So uh, I will be at Tales of the Cocktail this year. We all will. And I cannot wait to maybe live that moment again through Speed Rack, <laughs> but this time I'll be watching. You had mentioned uh, Tales of the Cocktail, and for our listeners and viewers who don't know what this iconic industry event is, could you tell, explain what this is? We know it takes place in New Orleans, but tell us what it is and what you're most looking forward to at this year's 21st <laughs> anniversary. I cannot believe it's 21 already. It's, it's finally legal drinking age. <laughs> I was waiting. That took only three seconds. I was like, who's going to say it? <laughs> but, uh, of course. I mean, it's 21 always means so much to bartenders. Um, it's, it's, I started, went to my first one in 2006. So it started as a, a kind of a, like a tourism event that brought down cocktail lovers um, and cocktail historians. Um, to New Orleans, which is a wonderful place with a lot of birth of the cocktail, a lot of cultural exchange, a lot of delicious food, and and it was the right place to um, start a festival. Over the years, it's grown into like the the Comic Con of cocktails. <laughs> so you have, you know, a full week of tons of education, um, which I I've, I've been lucky enough. I served three years on the education um, board. Um, and um, you can go and take really cool classes from a bunch of people maybe you've read their books or people who are operating places all over the country and then you can also attend really fun events and parties by every large liquor portfolio so this year is actually laura's first tales very excited what advice do you have for laura and all of the other newbies who might be listening or watching drink water is a big one drink water is a big one it's new orleans it's hot um pack more clothes than you think you need because it's at least three changes a day that's what everyone (laughs) keeps telling me and then i i would say uh it truly is about sampling and tasting um so you don't have to drink every cocktail that's given to you. Um, you know, it is about tasting. They they do it like serve them tasting portions. So that's great. Um, and I definitely say make a plan and try to like map out every day of the things you want to hit. Um, by nature, you will probably miss around two or three of those. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but you know, don't forgive yourself. You're having a good time at a place. Stay. Don't try to drive yourself nuts trying to run from event to event. Um, but definitely make a, a plan is good and, and, and maybe like have accountability buddies to, to kind of roll with as well. Rich, will you be my accountability buddy? Yeah, that sounds great. Yes, totally. Okay, yes. thank yes. you. So uh, listen, we, we love this question. We like to ask it of all of our amazing guests. What is one lesson that your career has taught you? that you think everyone should learn at some point in their life? I think it's to um, always do what you say you're gonna do. (laughs) I had a lot of opportunities come to me because I just followed through. Um, 
I was good at, you know, even when I worked till four or five in the morning, I would wake up and always check my emails. Um, and a lot of opportunities came my way and I was the first person who was awake at 9 a.m. and answered them. So, so the opportunity went to me. So, Oh, so I'm thrilled because we are up to a very fun part of the show called Flambe. Are you ready to be flambeed? I'm ready. Okay. I'm born for this. All right. So we're <laughs> going to have some rapid fire questions coming at you. They're this and that. So you just um, choose an answer or give, uh, you know, your one word answer. And, and it's just about having right. fun together. So let's jump in. Are you ready? Ready. All right. First question. Martini or Negroni? That's a hard one. Mm, martini. Mar- I'm surprised it's, like, it's going to be martini. Uh, tequila or cognac? Cognac. Neater on the rocks. Neat. Flour or corn tortilla? Corn. All right, here's one for you, the New Yorker and you. New York slice or a New York bagel? New York slice. <laughs> <laughs> Good choice. All right, so this is uh, an homage to when we're all in New Orleans in July. A frozen Irish coffee or an absinthe house frappe? Absinthe house frappe. <laughs> what is your favorite word? Hmm. Ally. Ooh. Ooh. And what is your favorite song on your Daiquiri Timeout playlist? How do you know I have a Daiquiri Timeout I told playlist? you <laughs> that I may have YouTubed and watched a ton of videos of you. And oh, yeah. That's, that's easy. I mean, there's, there's a, it's a lot of great music in there. Um, if I would say really quickly, like something that, that hits me great, uh, I love the uh, version of Fever on there by La Lupe. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. I kind of I kind of love classic songs that get that get remade, remixed. <laughs> Excellent choice. All right, final question for you: What is your go-to toast or cheers? Um, it is to cheers, cheers with your left hand because it's closest to your heart. Oh, oh cheers I with like your that. left hand because it's closest to your I heart. I love that, and, and I learned that from a very important uh, master blender, so Lorena Vasquez. <laughs> That's wonderful. It, it definitely meant a lot to me when she would say that, always. Well, thank you. And thank you for being flambéed. And thank you for joining us, <laughs> Lynette. It's been an absolute pleasure to shake it up with you. Thank you for all of your advice and for everything you're doing to move the industry needle forward. And now it's time for Up, Neat, and On the Rocks with, and we're very excited about this, Moet Hennessy's First portfolio mixologist, the one, the only Charles Hardwick. Woo! Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome Thank to you. the Glad show. Glad to be here. Yeah, hey Charles. Hey Rich, how are you? So Charles, <laughs> we have been so excited to work alongside you and call you a colleague. And Thank you. we are all impressed with your amazing background in mixology, in bartending, and in the trade. Can you tell us a bit more about your incredible experience? Sure. Uh, Yeah, so as you said, my name is Charles Hardwick. Uh, I am a hospitality and specifically bar hospitality professional. I've been working in the industry for just over 30 years, so I'm going to date myself by being that specific. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, And I've done a wide variety of things in the industry related to bars and spirits. Um, I really started off very humbly working at, you know, Southern Barbecue Joints, serving uh, something called a Lynchburg Lemonade. That's one of the things I used to serve, which is basically Tennessee whiskey and, and lemonade. A lot of what we call one and ones gin and tonics, you know, things like that. Uh, and then things move along and the cocktail renaissance happens. Those were the dark ages. Mm-hmm. The cocktail renaissance happens really in the late 90s, you know, early 2000s. I uh, started working at a place called Pravda, which, you know, really spawned a lot of the mixology movements that yielded employees only eventually. And then just before I came to this table and to this company, I was working at the Mandarin Oriental uh, luxury five-star hotel at a place called The Office. Uh, And that leads me here. Um, I was excited to join this portfolio and this company because of so many amazing brands, so many amazing stories to tell. And at the end of the day, bartending is not only about serving, it's not only about mixing people and mixing ingredients, it's also about telling stories. Oh, we love that. Storytelling is one of our favorite pastimes. So 
you are Moet Hennessy's first portfolio mixologist. And at the top of the show, we were discussing where the term mixologist came from. And in our mm -hmm. research, we learned that it means something different to a lot of people in the industry. Sure. So I'd like to ask you, what does the word mixologist mean to you and how do you define it? Sure. Um, I define mixology as a craft cocktail approach to making drink, mix, mixing drinks and making drinks. Uh, you bring your personality, you bring your experience, you bring your creativity and your storytelling to the creation and the crafting of cocktails along with the hospitality that you're showing to people when they arrive at your bar. Um, you're gonna really look at the context of the evening, of the season, of the occasion potentially, um, whether it's the person's first drink of the day or the evening, is it before dinner, is it after dinner, is it, you know, with some snacks. So I think, you know, mixology is a lot more, it's just a more detailed, creative um, approach to bartending that brings all of those things to bear in the experience. Charles, do you remember our first day together? Yes, I do. Oh my God, if you said you didn't remember, <laughs> I would freak out. I was like, should I tease her about this or just No, like, don't tease it? me, don't yeah, tease yeah, yeah. me. Yeah, no, so Charles and I started together at Moet Hennessy together, and um, he said something to me on our first day in between about 75 Zoom calls that we had, yeah, and uh, it was about why you chose Moet Hennessy. You know, mm. I've had the pleasure of getting to know you um, over the last, what is it, four months, yeah, five four months? months yeah. And one of my favorite things about you is how you, you're very selective in what you work on and who you work with, and I was really touched about why you chose Moet Hennessy to work mm. with. And I thought everyone who's listening in um, would want to hear your why. Yeah. Well, thank you. So yeah. share. Yeah. Well, there's, <laughs> a, there's a good amount to share there. And that's a, a question I'm very happy to, to answer. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, a big part of the craft cocktail movement and approach to uh, making cocktails involves storytelling. You know, it also involves the finest uh, ingredients, the finest quality ingredients from the spirit to you know, fresh juices and so on, working with the finest ingredients. Moet Hennessy has plenty of both. It has plenty of stories, it has plenty of heritage, it has the best, in my opinion, certainly the best champagne portfolios, the best spirits. So it gives me an opportunity to balance that storytelling and that heritage that, you know, as I said, Moet Hennessy brings to the table just in terms of uh, its background and the background of its spirits, but also that, that quality. You know, it really just is like such an amazing platform, such an amazing uh, company, such an ama amazing heritage that that just excited me. And on top of that, champagne. <laughs> <laughs> now you're speaking Angela's language. Oh, yeah. We love champagne. Champagne <laughs> love all it. day. Love it. <laughs> uh, I have a fun fact about Charles. Yeah. So <laughs> actually, Charles is one of the few people I know here in New York City who was actually born and bred in New York City, which is super yeah. cool, which is my segue. Where was I born, though, Rich? Which hospital? Let's see how deep you dove you, into this. You did tell me this. I, I don't remember. Yeah. A very nice hospital. I like saying it because it's, it's you know, it just the, sounds the, very New York. The best hospital, probably. Where? Uh, St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital on the uh. side. <laughs> But this is Near my John the, Saint John the this is my segue to talk about the cocktail you're making for us, which is called the New York Hospital Sour. Wait, no, no, no! no. I misread my notes. The New York Sour. Shame on you. Yeah, the New York Sour. Yes, the New York Sour. Yes, um, uh, the sour itself. Jerry Thomas is Bon Vivant's companion, you know, and that's kind of where the recipes were first put down, uh, written down. And the, in the case of the New York Sour, it may not even have its origins in New York. Mm. Uh, it's around the late 19th century, around the 1880s or so. No one really knows exactly where it was invented, but it may have been uh, invented, in fact, uh, in the second city, not the first city of New York. Uh, that said, we're going to make uh, one for you today. Uh, we're going to get started with, as I said, the finest, freshest ingredients. Lemon here. Um, I'll talk you through. I'll talk you through the recipe. Uh, as I am going. This, uh, we just want to get basically three quarters of an ounce of citrus. You see my lo little weird looking yeah, so juice press that. here. So the folks who can yes. are watching Amazing this, takeaway. the vodcast version, you if you're not watching it, watch the vodcast version just to see uh, his, his little lemon yeah, citrus juice. Yeah, it's really cool. It looks kind of like- It's actually really great. It's a really cool. Looking. It's very efficient. It looks like something from like Fisher Price or something. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It does you look know? like that. Yeah. I need one of those. So, you know, cocktails are all about balance, right? You know, so it's food, you know, balance of flavor, you know, like 
sweet, sour, maybe a little bit of salinity, you know, certainly the spirit, you know, effervescence in this case, though, we want to add, we have already have the three quarters of an ounce of the fresh lemon juice, which I've squeezed, squozen. Squozen? <laughs> I think that's the correct word. Squozen. Equal parts, basically. Squozen. of uh, This can be adjusted, too. This is another great thing about cocktails, as is the case with food. You know, if you want a little bit sweeter, make it sweeter. If you want a little bit more tart, you're going to put one ounce and three quarters of simple syrup, one ounce of, of lemon juice. So, But I'm doing equal parts. I think that will make for a really nice, balanced cocktail here. Um, so, again, three quarters of an ounce each of lemon and simple. You got our Woodenville. Whoops. That's actually two ounces, so I'm going to turn that jigger around. Now, you're using Woodenville? Woodenville bourbon. Sorry, I spilled a little bit there. But trying I'm to navigate the microphone. Can I share a fun fact about yeah, Woodenville? Talk to us. Oh. This is their straight bourbon. What I love about Woodenville is that this is a grain-the-glass bourbon. Everything made in Washington State. Woodenville is a little town outside of Seattle. And um, they're making incredibly, very, you know, highly regarded uh, uh, bourbon as well as rye whiskey out there in Washington. I love the story as well about the creators, the yeah. best friends. And I don't know, that to me sums up bourbon. It's about family and spending time with quality. And that, yeah. that brand so embodies, I think, what is the heart of that category as a whole. So that's one of my favorite details Two about best it. friends in one dream. Yeah. <laughs> yes, there that's true. Go. So... Let's get a little ice going here for those people who love the sounds of a cocktail being made. Uh, just a little bit more. Um, I like to describe uh, iced cocktails that are shaken uh, and poured over ice or shaken and, and served up as you're cooking with ice. Uh, the dilution, the temperature goes down instead of up, and you want to create that balance of flavors and the right dilution through the mixing process. I'm going to shake it very near to the mic because it sounds wonderful. <laughs> I received a shaking tutorial on the last podcast. That was a very good shake. For sitting down, yes, I would have. <laughs> so, yeah. so it's better to put your whole body into it. And then you're just straining over some fresh ice. If you want to do a large cube, if you have one of those you know, larger um, ice molds, you can certainly do that. That's really nice. That'll make for a nice, durable um, cocktail. And then we're going to just do a nice little float of... Rich, so yeah, well, you, do, you do red wine, and we're using Tarasas de los Andes Malbec. And Tarasas has been in Argentina for quite a while. They've been pioneers in high altitude winemaking. And some fun news uh, in 2025, every single vineyard, every single grape will be certified organic. We're That's excited exciting. by that. That's we're very excited, we're excited about, about that. that. Okay, uh, and what this does for the drink. Um, Really just provides some nice, soft, gentle tannins to and it looks um, gorgeous. the flavor looks profile. So and the visuals are wonderful. You can see that right there, I think, I hope. You know, sometimes when you layer cocktails with a spirit or a liqueur, it can sort of interfere with, um, at least at the beginning, with your flavor experience. In this case, because of the, the sort of relative lack of weight of the wine, that's why it floats on the top, uh, and the nature of the ingredients underneath, it, those actually come through and mix very well as you sip on the cocktail. So not only is it a nice, exciting visual element, the flavor element is not like interrupted or impeded or redirected uh, because you're doing the float on the top of the cocktail. It's actually very well integrated flavors. This is a beautiful cocktail, and if you are listening and not watching, go to YouTube, watch this. You have to see this beautiful sour that Charles has crafted for us. I don't think I can wait any longer. <laughs> I have to taste it immediately. It, please. Let's do it. Cheers, everyone. Thank you, Thank Charles. Thank you for having cheers me. Cheers to you, it's Charles. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. 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 That was a delicious cocktail. It was really great. Yeah. It's fantastic. Um, I don't know about you guys, but more so than other episodes, I feel like we covered a ton of information today. So I'd love a good recap. Uh, maybe we can kind of distill down some of our takeaways. I love it. You know I like to put a number with how many things we're going to talk about. Bet, so bet three. Yes. <laughs> it's time for three Mine's things three. that we learned well, in this episode. I would love to start off again. <laughs> it's becoming a habit. Um, I actually was very touched by today's episode. Um, I think my big takeaway was this idea that it's great to have a dream, 
But when you mix that dream, much like a cocktail, mm. with uh, you know ambition and most importantly I, the honesty, right? I, I I do what I say and I and I and I mean what I what I say, and anything is possible. And that was sort of my big takeaway from. Um, Lynette Marrero's interview that we had. I mean, look at what she did for not just women, but what she's done to um, develop her, the culture of mixology around the world. And, and, and in speaking with her, she did it through dream, ambition, and showing up honestly. And I think that's a, that's a pretty great way to live your life. It was super cool to have Charles Hardwick on. You know, he's our in-house portfolio, it's a multiple brand mixologist, Moa Hennessy, 30 year veteran. It's like every day I learned something new about something he had done in his past, it's, it's incredible. And he made, honestly, one of my favorite cocktails. I love a New York Sour, and with the Woodenville and the Tarasas float on top, that was brilliant. It's big fan, big fan. It was brilliant. You know, I my, my thought is this, Moet Hennessy is finally in the mixology game as a portfolio for the first time. It is really exciting, especially with the addition of Charles. I mean, yeah. having him as our colleague is such an honor. And our team, the trade engagement and advocacy team, we're new and we truly believe in the power of mixing. We're focused on people, you know, education, storytelling, podcasting. Podcasting. <laughs> and honestly, I'm really excited for the road ahead. All the pioneering ideas, all the innovations, telling more stories, connecting with more people. That's a good way to round us out. Yeah. Well. Well, like, follow, subscribe. See you guys next time. <laughs>